Hey Playheads, you're watching Schwitzen with Norm, the show that lifts the bar high and sets the bar low. On today's show, which promises to be meh, we have, um, what do we have? We went back to City Hall to shake things up a little bit. We have a couple weird lifts for you as always. Uh, we have an interview with preeminent doctor and New Bedford's First Lady, Ann Partridge. <laughs> And a uh, segment that is near and dear to my heart, a tribute to my coach, Brian Derwin. I would like to apologize in advance for what you're about to see. Sue, as usual, forgot to take the lens cap off the camera, so now this is like another take. So anyway, blah, 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 we're here with Mike Pires, one of the very best in the biz. He's a track guy, his mentor and idol, and... Uh, Godfather to your children? Yes, Steve Gardner. Is Steve Gardner. Learned so everything I know from him. And I learned some of what I know from him. Mm -hmm. Anyway, terrible laugh on that guy, oh, though. Oh, God, It's awful. awful. <laughs> anyway, we're now going to show you what we've called the Gardner Step Up. So this is going to be a really exaggerated range of motion uh, drill. There's some pulling with the you know hip extensor, some pushing, uh, cycling, dry phase, all that stuff. So why don't you actually be like a model when you're running, most world-class and decent sprinters want to uh, mimic a cycling action like you're on a bicycle. You never want to have that foot fall too far in front of the hip because now you're trying to push and pull through too much. We want to get that knee up, toe up, and come down to the ball of the feet right in front of the hips so that you can start that second cycle action. It almost looks like you're riding a bicycle when you watch a good sprinter running down the track. And we want to try to incorporate some of that into what we're doing here on the uh, boxes today. And coach, what happens after your foot is behind your, you know, little bit of a push? You're getting a little bit of a so, push. Very, very exaggerated range of motion exercise. So we're going to have a little bit of pulling, we're going to have pushing, and just for the cherry on top, we're going to throw like this on, so we have like an opposite side knee drive, uh, hip flexion as well. One more thing we forgot to add, we're going to add a little drive phase into this as well, Norm. When you stop running, whether it be coming out of the blocks or if you're a wide receiver, coming from a standing stop, a drive phase is when your shoulders are in front of your hips and you're driving through to get up to top speed before you lift and start going. So we're going to finish off in a drive phase position today. And the front foot may be a little bit further in front of where we normally would have it if we were in a cycle phase. And Did I get that? You got everything good. Okay. What's this called? This is the Steve Gardner step up. No, no, just the Gardner step up. Oh, the Gardner step up. And why are we calling it that? Because he's the guru. He taught me That's this. That's right. And and he always talks about pushing and pulling in. And Gardner, sprinting. maybe one day you'll, you know, think of us when uh, you hit it big. All right, this is a take two. The guy's so powerful, we had a little bit of a equipment failure, so we uh, had to, like, readjust with some heavier tubing, and so here we go. But I'm not going to, like, you know, get any closer than that. Yeah, it's okay. So we start off in our little cycle phase, knee on the box. We're going to go to and finish in a drive phase in our pushing and pulling action. Good job. Oh man, that is a hell of an exercise. There you go. So that was truly, it wasn't exactly a weird lift of the week, but it was truly a weird exercise of the week. We thank Coach for helping us out. Awesome job. I and want to thank you for having me, Norm. Oh man, anytime you're in the, you know, monster factory, it's always <laughs> a good day. And uh, Gardner, how about a little something for our efforts here, you know, in the way of, you know, a cookout at his house maybe? Something like that. All right. We appreciate everything All right, so house. if you ever see anyone doing this in some other gym out in California and you, you see where you, uh, I am mumbling, all right, screw it. Is that good enough? <laughs> We landed an A-lister for today's show, New Bedford's own Dr. Ann Partridge. She's a renowned doctor of oncology. She's a professor of medicine at Harvard's Medical School. And she's also the director of Dana-Farber Survivorship Program. And if that resume doesn't do it for you, she's also our Fair City's first lady. Mayor John Mitchell's better half. And when I say better half, I'm not fooling around. How we ever pull that one off is anybody's guess. We're in the cave with uh, New Bedford's first lady and a world-renowned oncologist. 
And so let the games begin. First question. Many people regard oncology as nothing more than a pseudoscience. You know, using the constellation to predict people's daily lives sounds like snake oil. How do you answer your critics? Well, first I would say that what you just referred to sounds a lot like astrology. No! Oncology, which is spelled with an O, not an A, is really the practice of caring for people with cancer and the research and science that goes into that. So there's, a, I think, so oncology. So not the horoscopes. We try, you know, every now and then we do bring in the horoscopes. There are no atheists in the foxhole. So we do worry about these things. And we do bring in the stars sometimes, but that being said, for the most part, we try to practice what we call evidence-based medicine, which is rigorous science. And usually, again, unless you're studying true astronomy, then there's not that much science from what I understand beside, behind astrology. Thank you for the clarification. Mm -hmm. That's embarrassing. So we're talking about cancer now. That is such a frightening uh, subject matter disease for so many of us. Give us some good news. Temper our fears. So I wish I could fully temper fears. Cancer still is a really bad disease for many people. Right, right. There's still far too many people in the U.S. and around the world that die of cancer. That being said, most people these days, thank goodness, will be survivors. And they will live long and happy lives. In fact, I focus on survivorship. I focus on things like telling people to get out there and schwitz with Norm okay. after their cancer diagnosis so that they can, A, live a long and happy life and get all the cardiovascular fitness. And then the really exciting part that I think you'll like a lot is that there's an accumulating body of evidence that suggests that people who schwitz with Norm or exercise in general right, right. actually do better, not just from a you won't die of a heart attack, but they're less likely to hear from their cancer again or die of it. How cool is that? Uh, switching gears, if you don't mind. I ha uh, live in a historic house and um, I need windows. So am I allowed to get replacement windows in vinyl or do I need to get those reglazed or do I need to replace them with wood? I, I know when we talk about the list of reducing risk factors for cancer, exercise is always a common one. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit sort of standoffish about that because th there's such a genetic component to cancer sure. that there are a lot of hucksters that are like, do some sit-ups and it'll solve all your problems. And you yeah, know, no. obviously Lance Armstrong was, I imagine, in pretty, pretty good, good shape, shape, right? Yeah. And so... The good news is exercise over and over again is good and good for you. And so if it's not going to prevent it, like in testicular, then it for sure is gonna help you get through treatment better. The more in shape, you think Lance Armstrong was in, it was still hard to get through what he got through, but right, don't you right. think he got through it better oh, because he was who yeah. he was well, versus- I would, I would think so, for sure. Yeah. yeah, and you know, and his steroids probably didn't hurt him there either because you know, they help with side effects of treatment. Oh, I didn't know that he was dirty. Can you maybe elaborate on the exercise piece of the puzzle Absolutely. with prevention, with recovery, with- Well, let me just clarify one thing for you and anybody who's watching us. Cancer is not one disease. Right, right. Right? And so, for example, your Lance Armstrong example, I don't think testicular cancer is associated with exercise. Meaning, mm -hmm. it hasn't, it's not so clear that not exercising is a risk factor for that, or that exercising can reduce risk. That's in contrast to diseases like breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, all of which exercise is associated with people having lower risk. It's not the only risk factor. Right. And so if people have, you know, other reasons to get the cancer, it's nature and it's nurture. And there's a whole other lifetime of things that people can be exposed to that can put them at risk for cancer. Plus it's what they bring to the table in terms of their genetics as you alluded right, right, to. Right. So one risk factor usually doesn't tell a story for any given person. Mm -hmm. I am on a medication for a somewhat embarrassing problem. That's the name of it. Okay. And it's supposed to like kind of be a little bit on the liver. You know, I'm someone that doesn't mind having a beer after mm -hmm. a tough workout on a Friday night. Mm -hmm. What would you say is like you the tipping point? On it? I don't want you to try to okay. guess what like I have wrong with me on camera. It's easy. Shh. Yeah. I, I don't remember exactly what that does to the liver. Sometimes it can ramp up your ability to, to process alcohol, some of those things. Oh, really? And some of them can decrease it. So you can end, ever, you can end up being a cheap date or, and hurting yourself right, right. in different ways, 
or you can actually up processing, but it can screw up your liver. Let's do that one. So first of all, there are a lot of feel-good stories, right? right? A lot of people are doing well, and even when we don't cure the cancer, the progress that's been made over the last 20 years has been, I mean, I've been in this business for 20 years. Okay. And it's amazing to see, for me, the way it's changed. It's exploded in terms of the opportunities for treatments that are dramatically improving how people do both cures, but also people living longer with disease that's under control. It's been dramatic. Uh, so Just that, within your, because within I, my I, last 20 I, years. I, you may or may not know this, so I lost my mother to breast cancer in the early 80s. And so it's it must be just the landscape is just so different now than uh, yeah uh, it's dramatically different that doesn't mean we still don't lose far too right, many people right, to cancer right, right. we do and that's why we keep doing what we do right. and that's why you know i sh slept to boston every day basically mm -hmm. to continue to try and do research to support better our patients and to do better than we do even today which is better than it was 20 years ago which is dramatically better than it was 40 years ago so, so lots of progress and I'm just going to interrupt you and say, you know, when you say like the bearer of bad news, yeah, it's, you know, it's a, it can be a dirty job. Yeah. It can be, you know, tough, but, you know, you kind of, who are you going to take that challenge on? You're going to run away. And who's the... I would you know, run, you know, you but that's how run. I run. But, but you think about it and you say, okay, can I do this well for this person? You know, can I help this person to see some hope and some light when I'm also giving them some not such great news? Right, right. And help them, you know, they got what they got, you know? How can I help them to make what they've got better? Most people can be helped. Most people can have a better experience, even with the ultimate, like we failed. You know, this did not work well enough. We obviously didn't have a cure for this, that sucks. But to make that better for a person, sounds like a terrible job, but from where I sit, it's better than not making it better. No, no, And it's, it's pretty important. critical. Aside from all of your life-saving and your research and all of that kind of stuff, more importantly, what is John Mitchell really like? How much time do you have? Not much. Yeah, we can't go into it. Okay. I can do this. Of course you can. You gotta believe in yourself. <laughs> do it for the kids out there. Okay. All right. Which is your favorite kid, speaking of kids? I love them all differently. So I want you to like cross your leg. So another thing is nasty. The doctor becomes the patient. You're okay. gonna have a much better bedside manner now, I think, yeah, in the future. Right. I need to learn so, this lesson. <laughs> if you need a spot, I'm right here for you. How many should I do? Just 17 more, and then we'll call it a wrap. No, I want that there. Up there? Yeah. Would okay. you like me to show you first? No, I'm good. All right. Good. So you're trying to get all angles, so you're gonna roll I'm more to now. assume I'm this now. wall, that wall, but you I'm gotta get a, in there. I'm not a very compliant uh, training. Yeah, I can trainee. totally see that. So I feel like you're showing off a little bit. I'm not. We yeah, can you're switch. Kind of showing off. No, no, we're not. You're kind of showing off. It's okay. All right, listen. Okay. I'll can show we start the interview or not? There are a lot of med students that are going into into this field, or is there? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty popular field because people see the need, right? right. Everybody, I think everybody knows so. Yeah, that's no, that's exactly right. We everybody all knows touched by it. There's need there, and people go, don't go into medicine because they don't want to help people. They go in because they want to take on the tough jobs, mm -hmm. you know, and they are ready for it and. Um, or they may, may not be ready for it, but they get trained up for a long time in it. And I know we don't see it going down, we see it going up, and we see, um, you know, I think, it, yeah, it's not, it takes a special person, though, to focus on pancreas, you're right, or to focus on neuro-oncology. Okay. Because those are particularly hard diseases to treat, and neuro even when you cure someone, when they've had a tumor in their brain that was cut out, it's really hard to leave someone whole. Right, you know, right. So these are tough diseases, but thank God we have heroes who are willing to kind of say, I'll take that on and I'll help make that person's life better. And I'll do research so that maybe that the next person's life will be even better. That's pretty cool. If Dana Farber was to really kind of get on a good run, would we rather like crush cancer or smash cancer? Or crush. Crush? crush. Crush? Crush cancer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's do it. But if we really want to be honest about it, what we want to do is, eradicate is target it? and eradicate in a precise way so that we don't crush people. Okay, but the point is, I'm gonna drop weight on a cancer crab. All right, that's fair. That was good. He did get crushed.
damn, the thing won't break. Man, this thing's a tough little guy. For anyone that agrees to do our show and put their reputation on the line, as promised. Outstanding. I love it. That's I will the size zero this. that you asked for? Yeah, this is perfect. This is perfect. This is exactly what I wanted. Thank you. It was worth every penny. After our last elevator segment from episode four, we got a little pushback from the elevator operators union. They took offense that I might have implied that they're enablers who uh, further the decline of fitness. Anyway, uh, we've made up. We're back here at City Hall. They told me, hey, we want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And so here's what we've come up with. Hey, so I'm taking a bath. And I have one of those eureka type moments where I figure, hey, why not combine the dangers and the claustrophobia of an elevator with the exercise benefits of taking the stairs? I'm going to two. She's going to two. Yeah, go to, I'm we can't get you to two. two. This is the best idea since getting rid of net neutrality. Oh man, I've been waiting for something like this all my life. So what do you think? I'm just here to pay my f***ing water bill. This is really stupid. I'm enjoying the ambiance of the elevator and yet I feel like I'm taking the stairs. He gets it. Can I call you? No, don't call me. Hey, little obscure piece of history, local history. The Aerosmith song, Love on an Elevator, is loosely based on a sordid episode that happened right at this very spot. Oh, really? Yeah, Herman Melville, Sarah Morwood. Yeah. Norm, what is going on here? You can't be doing this. This is an attractive nuisance. Someone's gonna get hurt. The city will be liable. We need an indemnification agreement or something. We answer to a higher power. The age-old question of man versus machine. Old man, in this case. To burn. You want to know the best thing about like filming like a satirical comedy sketch on an elevator? What? It works on so many levels. <laughs> Tell all your friends. I will. Keep watching. <laughs> We're conducting a study here. You're gonna have to jump on this stair climber. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Are you here to pay your water bill? No, I mean your stupid show is screwing up City Hall, and I need to get up to the third floor. <laughs> Hey, come join the new revolution in fitness. I'm not doing that. Hey, if bringing exercise to the huddled masses is a crime, then lock me up. That's it, we're done. Tell the world my story. In barring from our British friends from across the pond, I believe that qualified as a weird lift segment. We're here uh, with Meng. She is a swimmer and a track star, or a track participant at least, if not a star. And she's also a very gifted uh, student, right? And she's teaching me Mandarin. And I understand that I am getting a, a little bit of a following in China. And so if you can be so kind to uh, translate everything we say here today, that'd be very helpful. OK, do you understand? So we start out by saying, you're watching Schwitting with Norm. And just do that in. Uh, Watching. What? Watching Fitzing? Schwitzing. Schwitzing. 
Can we edit this part out? There is no direct translation for that. <laughs> All right, what about sweating? Just replace sweating with that, yeah. okay? But do a sarcastic word of sweating, like glistening or you know, dripping or anything like that. It doesn't matter, okay? So now, you're not going to put this stupid stuff in the show, are you? Please, um, for all of my fans in China, you were watching Schwitzing with Norm. 大家好,欢迎收看和Norm一起出汗. That's not my name in Mandarin. Oh, by the way, um, disclaimer, she has um, some weird stuff going on face-wise because it was character day in school and she went as like the Incredible Hulk and so she has a little green tinge on her nose. So she is going to be demonstrating the cable squat. This is a really great exercise. Um, and so let's just, I'll just talk as you go. Okay, walk it back a little bit. Alrighty, and so let's get some reps. Sit back a little bit more. There you go. And so this weight up front is counterbalancing her, so it's allowing her to be back a little bit more on her heels. There's a little bit less shear stress on the knee. We're bringing the hip into it a little bit more, taking the knee out of it a little bit. It's sort of like a deadlift, but the weight distribution is, is much different in that it's allowing her to be like back a little bit more than what would happen with a hex or a traditional deadlift. Just maybe 25 more. Hey, Mung. Yes. This uh, Adam walks into a bar and orders a beer, and the bartender's like, hey, you look a little bit distraught. Is everything OK? And the Adam's like, hey, I think I may have lost uh, an electron. And the, uh, the bartender's like, are you sure? And he's like, yes, I'm positive. <laughs> why, why, why are you doing another set? And why do you like make an adjustment? Because my handle was off. Oh, OK. So wait, do you want to say anything? You're embarrassed about your uh, voice on camera? No, not really. I'm embarrassed by mine. It's <laughs> no. very nasally. All right, so you want me to wrap it up? Um, so that was an example of weird lift of the week. Weird lift of the week. I think you mispronounced that last word, no? Anyway, we thank Mung for participating in this. That was the cable squat. Just a good version. There's like less compression on the spine than if you load like this. And also, again, the, the thing about that, and we're showcasing this machine in a completely different way than one of our early lifts, is that you know it allows her to just be back on her heels more and facilitates the position that we were aiming for more so than just overloading the muscles. Does that make sense to you? Yes. OK. And what's your grade point average right now? 3.93. Uh, Mm, you could be four. That's what mine was. Okay, so there's still room for improvement. But you know, self-improvement is a passion of mine, and so hopefully, you, you know, you can take from my lead. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> it's my honor and privilege to bring you this long overdue tribute to my coach, my mentor, the great Brian Derwin. Small disclaimer, this thing started out as a labor of love. It uh, turned into the gong show. We had to cobble together a flip phone video with a PowerPoint and a voicemail. Now would be a good time to lower your expectations. But in the spirit of uh, poor production values, like an Ed Wood movie, try to enjoy this anyway. A standout two-sport high school athlete, Brian excelled in both football and track. He then continued his two-sport success collegially at Lehigh University, where he met then-graduate student John Garhammer, who would later emerge as a renowned sports scientist. It was Garhammer who introduced Brian to Olympic-style weightlifting. Brian Derwin and I had a special relationship. I first met him on the football field at Lehigh University. I was playing offensive center, and Brian had won the starting guard spot. I reveled at his intensity and love for the sport. When the competition was high, Brian was always at his best. He's a great competitor. He would excel in competition. He also would practice hard. I mean, it seemed like every time we lifted weights, he'd lift a heavier weight or he'd do more repetitions, 
or have less time between sets. And you know, it's an honor to train with them, but sometimes it got discouraging. It was like repeatedly going to a pickup joint with a ladies' man, because you know he's getting lucky and you ain't. During the off season, Brian apparently did powerlifting and he needed someone to work out with. By the grace of God, he asked me. Brian brought on the full brunt of building muscle and increasing stamina. I have no doubt that this advantage showed in my junior and senior football campaigns and eventually led to being drafted by the New York Giants in the National Football League. I played three years in New York and 10 in New Orleans. Thank you very much, Brian. Some years later, at a weightlifting meet in Vineland, New Jersey, Brian was approached by famed weightlifting coach Bucky Cairo, who persuaded Brian to join his team, the Belleville Barbell Club. Bucky honed Brian's weightlifting technique, taking him to national prominence. 1980 would prove to be an exceptionally notable year for Brian, being named Weightlifter of the Year and earning a spot on 1980's Olympic team. I first met Brian Derwin as he was reaching the pinnacle of his athletic performance as America's top 100 kilo lifter. The first time I saw him lift, I believe, was at the 1980 Olympic Trials in Philadelphia. I was nearby when Brian had his career-ending injury at the 1981 Nationals, after which we stayed in periodic contact, dealing with the sport and its direction. I watched favorably as Brian steered USA Weightlifting to its most successful performance tenure when he served as the organization's president from 1996 to 2000. Brian was a great weightlifter. Anybody that made, you know, made an Olympic team, you know, unfortunately, here he, he made the team, you know, he boycotted, that was 1980. But uh, he, was, he was a world-class lifter. He held the national record in the major. I believe it was uh, 207.5 kilos, which would translate to 457 pounds. So he, you know, he was, as, he was as good as you could get, you know, in his time, he was the best. In his weight class, he was the best in the country. So he was a great weight. Hello, Brian. This is Jim Schmitz here. Uh, he had a great day in 1980 when he made the Olympic team with an American record clean and jerk. That was an awesome performance. And uh, unfortunately, his uh, career came to an end the next year at my competition in San Francisco where he had dislocated your elbow. But you're a national champion, Olympic team member. That's a pretty uh, outstanding athletic career. And then, of course, you went on to coach many top athletes, uh, Bob Jones and uh, uh, I can't think of the, the woman uh, heavyweight. Uh, her name will come to me later. certainly we left your fingerprint on USA with many contributions as an athlete, coach, and administrator. After hanging up his weightlifting belt, Brian would go on to be an accomplished weightlifting coach and an active administrator serving as president of USA Weightlifting and as an executive committee member of the United States Olympic Committee. Very positive, uh, reinforcement type of uh, coach. He'd tell you he did something, well that was really nice, but you know, there was always a but. Maybe not towards the end, but you, know, you, you can never make it perfect. And that's what he was always striving for, you know, so I, you know, I just took his, I had faith in him, and listened to him, and you know, it took me far in the sport. Aside from his athletic and business acumen, Brian has always been known as the sharp dresser. Thanks, Jen, for those shorts. Really made the day. These are original handwritten Brian Derwin workouts. If you flip through these things, you can see what a sick maniac the guy is. Now, Brian had this wonderful ability to spit. He could spit out a straight, narrow, long stream of water. This came really handy on Saturday nights on the hill 
when he would take a mouthful of kerosene or lighter fluid, spit it out in this straight, narrow, long stream, and light it on fire and become a human blowtorch. He put sauce presses in my workouts. He didn't even write those in to make me a better weightlifter. He just enjoyed laughing at my subpar flexibility. Now, coaches use quotations for inspiration, and so did Brian. But instead of quoting Alfred Lord Tennyson or Vince Lombardi, he quoted a Zap Comics character named the Checkered Demon. He'd walk around and say, nice day for something, nice day for something. In the 100 kilo class, Brian Derwin was the winner. His clean and jerk, 457 and a quarter, tied the American record. Combined total for Brian Derwin, 799 to capture the crown at 100 kilos. I'd just like to thank him for everything he did for me back when I was younger, because when you're a young kid, you don't appreciate uh, the things people do for you. He, he sure did a lot for me, so I'm uh, very grateful to Brian. I wouldn't trade my time nor college friendship with Brian for anything. Brian elevated me in a way that he will never know. It's been a pleasure indeed to know and work with Brian Derwin over the past 40 years. Here's to 40 more. Brian Derwin shall always be a fire breathing. Olympia. Thank you, Brian Derwin, my friend, the Dirt Man. Much love, John Hill. Well, that wraps up another disappointment. Our deepest apologies. A uh, few people to thank, nonetheless. Thank you to Mayor Mitchell. We're not worthy! We're not worthy! Thank you to everybody from City Hall that put, put up with our ridiculous tomfoolery. Um, thank you to my guest uh, demonstrators for Weird Lift of the Week. So many people to thank for um, the Brian Derwin piece that we can't even name separate people. Thank you very much to uh, Dr. Ian Partridge. And until next time, warm up properly and always make your reps. New Bedford Cable Network public, educational, and government access. Channel 95 is public access. Channel 9 is educational access. Channel 18 is government access. New Bedford Cable Network. We're more than you know us for.